Good evening everyone, this is Wayne over at the Alchemical Tech Revolution YouTube channel. Tonight we're going to do part two of the series that I'm calling Unseen Forces as we look at a book by Mr. Manley P. Hall of the same name. And uh, in part one we went through uh, what he called the natural spirits or the nature spirits. Uh, which would be elemental type uh, spirits and powers. And uh, we're going to continue with that reading here tonight, uh, starting in chapter 3. We went through the first two chapters previously, which covered those uh, various areas of the elementals and the nature spirits and the powers that uh, operate in the background uh, in our world that we are unaware of. So uh, we're going to go to part two here tonight, which starts in chapter three. And we'll just begin the reading, and I'll just, uh, you know, pepper throughout the, the uh, show here where I read uh, the text, uh, where I see fit to, uh, to pause and give a little bit of uh, uh, my take on things. I'll do so as we go along. But uh, let's get right into it. Chapter three. Thought forms and emotion elementals. It has been ordained that man, like his God, shall become a creator. The spark of life within him is capable of giving eternal life to the undifferentiated particles existing in nature. In other words, in man is a touchstone which changes in, into substances like to itself all with which it comes in contact. As the universe is peopled by the sparks from the wheels of God, so the elements of nature are peopled with the sparks flying out from the wheels of life, twisting and whirling within the lower organisms of nature. Man is a god in the making. He is much closer to godhood than he realizes or that it is safe for him to know. The infinite desire to create pulses through his blood as it courses through the being of deity. Every moment of his life he is expressing the godlike qualities of creation. Not only does he create his kind and perpetuate his species through natural law, but upon the higher planes of nature he is also creative. As his physical organisms reproduce their kind, so also are their other children born out of his being. Recalling the four creations from the body of Brahms, we may now say that from the symbolical substances of the feet of Brahma, material earth, the thighs of Brahma, ethereal water, the breast of Brahma, astral fire, and the brain of Brahma, mental air, are fashioned the quaternary vehicle by which the spiritual ego is able to function in the physical, ethereal, astral, and mental worlds. Man, through the medium of generative powers in the physical world, assists in the forming of the physical bodies of his fellow creatures. He is likewise able to direct planes of substance for the expression of other waves of evolving life, purely physical. Upon the third world, where the red man was born out of Brahma, there pours forth from the Brahma in man a great stream of creatures built by himself, as much his children as the physical bodies produced in this world. He is, he is as responsible for these as he is for his own flesh and blood, which grows up around him in the form of his children and descendants. We do not understand this because these children are invisible to the normal functional sight of the physical world. The trained clairvoyant, however, is able to see them and realizes that as surely as we are peopling this world with children who are to grow into its future rulers, so surely we are peopling the astral plane with the children of our emotions. Strange, fiery creatures born out of our own emotional body with its great whirling vortex in the liver. This body is the lion of the cherubim, and from it there streams forth into the world the offspring of the emotional plane. Gonna pause right there, folks. What he's saying here is a very clear indication as to why those people in positions of power try to manipulate you through the use of fear, through your emotion. You see, they're trying to instill in your psyche uh, this mindset of fear, and from this mindset of fear, you see, uh, these quote-unquote emotional elementals um, could be born 
and manifest in our physical reality in different ways. Although we do not see them ourselves, they're invisible uh, to uh, the, you know, the, the, the eyes of man uh, without, uh, you know, expressing some form of what they would call clairvoyance or something like that. You, you cannot see these actual forces working, but uh, this once again stems from the whole old hermetic idea of uh, the, the uh, principle of mentalism, whereas thought proceeds all. So from your thought and your emotion are born these different uh, forces in the natural world, and that's exactly what this is talking about. Now, anybody trained in the art of quote-unquote magic or, you know, a trained magician of sorts would call this something akin to, say, uh, an egregore or a tulpa, and that's exactly what they're doing. They use your emotions to create this this kind of uh, uh, situation, this, this spirit of that said emotion uh, to manifest in the world and spread in this world. So when they're manipulating you and using fear as a tactic for control, this is exactly the kind of energy that they are invoking. And it, it goes beyond just the, uh, the individual themselves. You see, the, the fear that you manifest uh, around you uh, proceeds from you and goes forth into the world at large and could actually affect others. And that's an important idea to keep in mind here. But uh, let's go on. That was the end of that first section there. And uh, we'll get into the second section of chapter 3 here. And this one's titled, Our Astral Children. The astral world is called a plane in nature. Human passion, compassion, emotion, and desire are the qualities which attune the body of the individual with the corresponding body of the macrocosmic man. God, or Brahma, as we prefer to call him, has a septenary constitution. Going to pause there, folks. Do you see... God, or they prefer to call him Brahma in this regard, um, and this is coming from Manly P. Hall, and this uh, is in regards to, you know, what the Masons believe and the Rosicrucians and all these different secret societies and orders. They would prefer to refer to God as Brahma. This is not the same God uh, that the Christian population uh, acknowledges as God. So let's uh, I don't want to get too hung up on that idea, though, but let's move on from there. I'll, re I'll read that again. We'll start from that sentence again. God, or Brahma, as we prefer to call him, has a septenary constitution. For each one of his bodies, there is a corresponding receiving pole or vibratory vortex in the human body. These poles, in turn, are centers of activity in man, which correspond to the greater plane centers in the universal man. And the universal man's capitalized, folks. Uh, this is, a, you know, another allusion to God or Brahma. Once again, see, they, they see uh, man as being a, a lesser version of God, um, which is not entirely wrong. Let's, let's be, you know, honest about that. That's not entirely wrong, but uh, it's not the same thing. So uh, let's continue on from there. There is little doubt analogically, that the planets of our chain are the permanent seed atoms of the universal man, and that each atom is the center of a septenary system of globes composed of varying degrees of density. In the man of the universe, these bodies are called planes of nature. In the lesser man, these planes are called bodies. At the present time, we are able to cognize only the wave of creation passing through the seven globes, which are attuned to material creation. It is safe to say, however, that in the great creation, Brahma creates waves of life on each of his planes or bodies, and that the invisible elements of nature are peopled with races, rounds, chains, and globes, passing through the septenary chain of manifestation, none realizing or understanding the existence of any other, or in turn being accepted or understood by any other. I'm going to pause right there, folks. Now, what this text is telling you is uh, what I would consider to be a truth in how the universe operates in a particular way. Uh, there are different planes of existence, and uh, they're kind of separated by... Uh, what would best be termed as frequency or vibration. Um, we're not attuned to the same frequency as, as many of these other quote-unquote unseen forces or these unseen uh, entities, per se. Uh, they're attuned to a different 
uh, world than we are. They're attuned to a different dimension, a different waveform, uh, a different frequency, a different vibration, so to say. That's the best way to think of it. Think of it in terms of, uh, say, the, the human body or the human being in the physical world here. The human body is a radio receiver, okay? It receives the broadcast signal that we're attuned to, which is here, which is our physical world. We're not attuned to, say, this astral plane or anything else like that. So it would be as simple as switching the, the dial on the radio to tune into this other bandwidth or frequency. And that's kind of what this alludes to with these different spheres of creation, this uh, septenary chain of manifestation that it's talking about. And this relates back to the whole concept of the, uh, the seven uh, wandering stars or planets in astrology. And these are representations of these, this different septenary chain. Uh, and that's that's kind of what this is alluding to here. So uh, when you look at this kind of an idea, these different worlds, they exist all around us, but we're just not attuned to them. Our, our radio dial is not tuned to them. So we do not perceive them. And uh, just because we do not perceive them does not mean they do not exist. And the things that we actually do in this world have ramifications in the other world. Uh, these other worlds, per se, but we do not see those because we're not attuned to those. Uh, that's one of those things where, uh, you know, there's consequences for actions, or, you know, the, it's the whole uh, principle of uh, uh, action-reaction, that kind of a whole idea, you see, uh, the, the whole cause-and-effect principle. That's what this is, and there's always unseen effects of things that we do and this is what we need to be mindful of these things uh i think are actual truths that are, are kind of uh you know put into into thought here and put down on words on the page here um and many of these ideas can be thought of in more allegorical terms a lot of times so how it's being described is probably the best way that it could be described for us in order to kind of understand what's going on but in my view, I think it's probably something that uh, would defy what we could understand, okay, the, the way that these other realities operate. Uh, it's, it's not something that we perceive. So in order to best describe it, uh, the author here is putting this in terms that we would probably best understand and describing it in ways that we would best understand. So I, I think that's kind of what's going on here. So a lot of this stuff, whether you believe it or not, um, there are people in positions of power in this world that do believe this stuff very wholeheartedly and act upon this information. So it's important that we understand this. And it helps to take a step back and look at this information as more allegorical or symbolic a lot of times uh, than anything else, rather than trying to take the literal interpretation. Because many times, uh, a lot of these secret societies, these writers in secret societies, they will put on the page uh, this literal interpretation, but that's not really symbolically what it means. So we have to be careful not to get too hung up on these different ideas. But I do think that there are unseen natural forces around us that do operate within this physical realm we live in, and also in the other planes around us, like the astral plane, the ethereal plane. I believe that these things are, you know, have the possibility of being real things. Uh, there are real worlds that exist all around us that we just don't perceive. So with that being said, let's get on with the reading. I don't want to get hung up too much on that, but I think a little bit of ex explanation uh, was due there to try and, uh, you know, uh, garner some meaning from the, that previous uh, paragraph that I just read. <clears throat> anyway, back to the reading. Since this is true of the great man, and since the law of analogy is as certain, is hold on one second, the law of an uh, analogy, an analogy, not analogy, or it, maybe it is analogy. Uh, sorry, I'm having trouble making out that word. This translation uh, has a little bit of smudging in the the print here. This book that was scanned. Um, and since the man, so let's let's start this sentence over. Since this is true of the great man, and since the law of analogy is a certain and exact science, we are safe in asserting that man, 
the little universe, it says in parentheses, is not only carrying on the work of expressing physical creation, but is also carrying on an elaborate series of astral and mental creations, which the trained seer is able to study firsthand, and the attributes of which he is able to list and label. Following is a resume of some of the outstanding features. Number one, there is a plane of nature corresponding to every one of man's bodies. Evolution consists in lifting the center of life consciousness from one of these planes to another by the gradual attunement of consciousness with the vibratory rates of that plane. Going to pause there, folks. You see, once again, it's, it's putting the idea of vibratory rates. Once again, uh, we could use the analogy of the radio tuner uh, to, to see what's going on here. But we'll also see that he's talking about evolution consisting of lifting the center of life consciousness from one of these planes to another by gradual attunement uh, with the next vibratory rate. So you see, the idea of evolution is much older than Charles Darwin, and it's not exactly uh, the way that he described it. Uh, so that's where many of these ideas come from, even though in more modern times uh, we have guys like Darwin and Galton and all these guys coming out with these ideas, such as evolution or eugenics, these ideas are far older and were once called something different within these mystery schools and these different secret societies. So you could see a lot of these ideas have their roots back in the ancient mystery schools. Okay? So we need to keep that in mind because this is kind of how our science, our modern science, or what we would call science, has been steered through many of these ideas that came forth through these different orders. Um, but I don't want to harp too long on that. Let's get back to the reading here. <coughs> Number two. To the Western Hemisphere, the physical world is the world of reality because the consciousness of the inhabitants of this hemisphere is concentrated solely upon material things, the sense centers being entirely enmeshed in the visible, the cognizable, and the physically tangible. And I'm going to pause there, folks. I would say that is a true statement. Our Western society is really hung up on this hyper-materialism thing. Uh, we're caught up in the hyper-materialist paradigm here. Everything's physical. They try to quantize everything, try to quantify everything. And that's basically what our quote-unquote science of today is all about, quantifying everything. If you can't measure it or you can't uh, uh, count it, it doesn't exist, according to our science. And that's what's going on here. But that is a, a, a fallacy in thought. Uh, when it comes down to it, there's many subjective things that are known truths and can be proved to be truths, but you can't quantify them or count them per se. It's a subjective thing. So this is where our modern science falls short. And uh, we'll see as we go through here, uh, many philosophical ideas kind of pick up where our science leaves off. Um, so let's continue on. Number three. The physical world is to us the reality and the only existing reality because we cognize the external through the vibratory rates of sense perception and our present rate of sense perception attunes us with the plane of the sudra or the lowest land, the feet of Brahma, the land of the servant. Gotta pause there, folks. See, we're attuned to this physical world and... Uh, he's calling this the plane of Sudra, or the lowest land, the feet of Brahma. And uh, we'll, we'll get a little further as we go through the reading here. Uh, you'll kind of begin to see a little more of uh, what he's talking about here. Okay, number four. In nature, there is a world or plane, one of the bodies of Brahma, to which man becomes attuned through the vibratory rate of the emotional Sutra... Sutratmic atom. The whirling of the atom produces a rate of vibration, and each of these seed atoms vibrates to a different key. To one capable of understanding them and whose senses have made the proper attunements, these atoms intone a mystic chant, the notes of which sound like the thunderous intonations of a mighty organ in nature. 
these tiny living things, never ceasing in their wondrous pinwheel motion, join the ensemble of the celestial symphonies of marching spheres. In a lesser way, they sing the chants sung by the planets, and in so doing, breathe out the sacred name of the Most High, that wondrous being made up of the tiny sparks of life, which robe themselves in this endless scroll of vibratory sound. Going to pause there, folks. In that number four there, there's a lot of important ideas uh, bound up in there. First of all, uh, there's the idea of seed atoms and that how they are uh, attuned to different keynotes. Okay, This is an important idea, and this is an important philosophical idea that uh, predates our written texts. Okay, uh, This is the idea of where the idea of atoms comes from, first of all. But this seed atom that they're speaking of that operates on this keynote vibratory rate is something totally different than how our science describes atoms. And uh, many of these uh, teachings and philosophies have been perverted by modern science. So now that's basically the, the core philosophy that our science has, is it looks at the world through the lens of atomism. Okay, Everything's a fundamental particle to the scientists. Because once again, this falls back to the hypermaterialist trap that we're in. Okay, everything needs to be quantified or counted uh, in order for science to acknowledge its existence. So this is exactly what they do. But this is a more philosophical idea being talked about here. But this is where the idea comes from. And once again, we could see how sound or frequency or vibration comes into play here as being an important thing. Um, so this is an important concept to keep in mind. Okay, but we're going to move on here to the next part. Number five, from the physical body of man, there extends an egg-shaped aura with the large end at the bottom. This aura, commonly called the astral body, is a series of swirling, twisting emanations in which the primary rudiments of the organs can be traced in spirals and pinwheels of colored light. Th this egg-shaped body radiates from 12 to 14 inches beyond the physical form and is the vehicle of conscious expression which attunes the little god to the emotions of the creator. Like the ruddy planet Mars, which is its key, this body glows with opalescent shades and coloring with pink, violet, and orange predominating. This body is as much a part of our organism as the physical body, and we function in it many years after the death of our physical form. Gonna pause right there, folks. So... This is an important idea, too. Uh, this astral body, this quote-unquote astral body, um, what they're calling it here, this aura, which is your astral body, um, it, it extends from 12 to 14 inches beyond your physical form, is what this says here. So this it relates to other important ideas, uh, like a uh, how you your, your essence extends or your consciousness extends beyond your body okay and i believe that there's some truth to this idea uh it it likens this thing to the vehicle of conscious expression uh, and it links it to the planet mars okay and that that's an important idea there we're talking once again about astrological type ideas and this is an archetype it's a nature archetype okay uh this represents a, uh, a natural energy, okay? So that's what this is talking about. And it talks about the different colors being pink, violet, and orange predominantly. So <clears throat> it says here that this aura, which is also commonly called the astral body, it's, it says here that this goes on many years after the death of our physical form. Now, is that true? I, I don't think there's really a way we could know that. Um, I think some of it may be speculative here. I think there might be something to it as well. But, uh, you know, whether... I, I think it's important to, once again, um, frame all this in the reference of whether or not you believe any of this stuff, there are people in this world who are in places of power that wholeheartedly believe in this stuff and act upon it. So... If, even if you think it's all nonsense, there's people in positions of power that don't think it's nonsense and take it very seriously, and uh, they act upon this to their own uh, best interests and not necessarily yours. So we need to keep that in mind. But 
let's get on with the reading here. <coughs> Excuse me while I clear my throat. Number six. This body expresses all the sentiments, emotions, desires, hates, fears, excesses, and active qualities of the human organism. From it pour out eternally into the astral plane of nature the man-created elementals which people this plane in the great universe. Gotta pause there, folks. You hear that? Man-created elementals which people this plane in the great universe. So, this is claiming that your astral form uh, has offshoots depending upon uh, whatever your emotional responses and things are of that nature that uh, manifest in this other plane, in this astral plane, and are living things, uh, created elementals. So you, you hear that. Uh, once again, this, this is invoking the idea of uh, what would be a type of a thought form, an egregore, a tulpa, whatever you want to call it. Uh, these, these ideas uh, really predate our written history, uh, a lot of these things. Now, is there truth to them? I think there may be something there. I think it uh, is, you know, representative of some type of a natural force, um, per se, or or something, you know, that that really um, does manifest from our thoughts. Uh, there's definitely uh, some evidence that this this does happen to some degree or another, but. A lot of it is very speculative, but uh, I think that definitely the author is trying to put some true things to uh, written form here. Um, and in so doing, uh, there's a lot really um, harbored within, within this writing here. Okay, A lot of different ideas all encapsulated in here. And like I said, sometimes you have to take a step back and look at it as, in an allegorical sense or in a symbolic sense as well in order to, you know, just keep uh, keep a, a firm grasp on, on the general meaning that the author is trying to convey here. And that being that uh, there are intelligent forces which guide our reality and uh, that our reality doesn't function in the cold scientific way that... Uh, you know, our, our science of today would try to like to explain to you of how it works. Uh, that's not what's going on. This it was, this, uh, you know, place we live was intelligently designed and created, and uh, it's intelligently guided. We're not in some random accident, okay? Uh, you know, like they would want us to believe. They want us to believe that uh, billions of years ago, nothing exploded and created everything, and... Uh, here we are, but that's not true. You look all around you, the evidence of design is everywhere. There's evidence of intelligent design everywhere. And see, that's the thing. The people at the highest, most levels of power in this world, they understand that. But they don't want you to understand that, because if you understand that, then you would have to uh, accept a couple of things that they don't want you to accept, okay? First of all, you would have to accept that there is a creator, a god, uh, you know, a being, an intelligent being that created this place. And second of all, that we may be answerable to this god. You see, that's what they don't want you to know because they want to be your god. See, that's what they want. They want to become god. They want total control. And they want you answerable to them. That's why they collect all your data and try to know everything about you and control every aspect of your life from cradle to grave because they want to be the gods of this place, you see. And they don't want you to understand that there is a benevolent creator out there that loves you and created this place for you. So they disguise that in many different ways and they try their very best to usurp this god's power. And become God themselves. And that's exactly what they're all about. That's what these secret societies have been about from the very beginning. The ancient mystery schools. All this stuff. It's about them wanting to usurp the creator and become God. And we'll get there. Uh, but let's continue on with the reading here tonight. Number seven. The astral plane was divided by the ancients into two grand divisions. Karma Loka and Devachan. 
These words express more adequately than any English words the qualities of this world. Karma loka, translated, means primarily the world of compensation. It has been identified by the religious organizations of Christianity with purgatory and is composed of the three coarsest planes of the astral world. It is well for us to realize that the so-called purgatory of the ancients is many times finer in its atomic principles than the physical world and that it interpenetrates physical matter. Though we are unaware of it, the eternal flames of hell are now in our very mists. Unseen and unrecognized, but absolutely harmless, because at the present time, we are functioning at a different rate of vibration. Going to pause there again, folks. Did you hear all that? Uh, once again, they're talking about the finer atomic principles of these uh, different planes of existence, or purgatory, or hell, per se. It exists all around us, but we don't feel it or see it or, you know, perceive it because we're not attuned to the same frequency. Do you see? I think there may be some truths to these ideas, but also, once again, um, you could see how Manly P. Hall invokes the atomic principle idea once again. Um, and whether he's invoking this in the philosophical sense or the scientific sense, it kind of muddies the waters here for people. Okay? So th that's the whole thing. When they're talking about atomic principles, that's where our modern science has really perverted many of these ancient philosophical ideas. Uh, so you could see it's talking about density of form or different vibration or frequency here. And uh, we've lost in our modern English language uh, a lot of forms of expression that older languages actually had they, they conveyed more meaning in fewer words than what we do with our English language the English language in my view has been uh, a language that's been created solely for the purpose of obfuscation and control so uh, you know many of the words we use um, do not have the same depth of meaning that other languages have in the past so it's kind of a contrived language used for the purposes of control um, so that's just my view, but not to harp too long on that idea. But let's get back to the reading now, because this is some interesting stuff. <coughs> Number eight. Into this lower division of the astral plane are poured the emotion elementals of man. Our hates and fears and excesses may be said to be pooled in the three lower planes of the astral world. There, the clairvoyant is able to see the fruitage of human degeneracy and the children born of the animal body of man. These creatures are often strange contradictions of the things a person would have the world believe them to be, for they register not the polish of his life, but the secret excesses of his being. As streams of demons and forms such as haunt the sleep of the opium fiend or flash before the eyes of the drunkard, we see the children born of the lowest side of God's fire world. They stream out from us every moment and feed this endless battling throng of seething fire beating beings that destroy each other in this world of darkness. This is indeed the inferno of Dante. Here in Karma Loka, the land of sin, man must meet his creations and confront the children of his vices. Gonna pause there, folks. Do you see, uh, you know, that this is kind of a dark... Uh, notation here, isn't it? This is talking about the idea of a personal hell and how we have to uh, confront our own demons. <coughs> uh, excuse me, had to clear my throat there. So anyway, this is talking about how our emotions and our vices and, you know, many of the things that we, we struggle with here in the physical world manifest in another layer of reality and this is uh, you know part of the astral plane that it's talking about here so are these ideas you know to be taken literally or is this allegorical it could be taken either way so uh, when we look at it that way there's there's some truth tied up in there but uh, once again it's one of those things where you could perceive it either as being a literal explanation or as more of an allegorical explanation uh, and keep in mind many of these things written by uh, many of these writers within the secret schools are written this way 
in order to convey a hidden meaning. So you can't look at the literal text here and think that this is literally what the guy means. Uh, there's a lot of allegorical things and symbolic things tied into these lessons too. But you get the idea. I think he's, he's kind of uh, giving us the general idea of what he's talking about here. How your emotions and your thoughts can manifest and have real world effects. Negative ones and positive ones. Uh, and, and we'll see. But let's continue on with the reading. Number nine. Man little realizes the immortality that he is capable of conferring upon his creations. There is a story told of the master Jesus of how, when a child at play, he molded clay pigeons and, tossing them into the air, gave them life so that they could fly up into the heavens. In the same manner, each one of us, with the power of immortality in our souls, is giving life to the substances of nature, molding them into the expressions of our temperaments and personalities, and launching them to float for ages in the subtle essences of being, and carry with them the blessing or the curse which are we ourselves have molded into them. And that's the end of that part of the text there. Um, <clears throat> a lot of important ideas uh, just wrapped up in that ninth part there. You see, it, this is, uh, you know, an admonition for man to be careful of those things that he puts his thought and will and uh, his desires into. Okay, because these things um, can be carry with them blessings or curses which we've molded into them. And the, we set these loose into the world at large and into the many uh, layered worlds that we live in, into the multiverse here. So our thoughts have more, uh, more power and consequence, we should say, is probably the better word, consequence. Our thoughts and our actions and our emotions have more consequence uh, in higher realms or unseen realms than what we would believe. So it's important to keep in mind. But... Now we're going to get on to the more interesting parts here. <clears throat> the next section here is called Thought Forms. Thoughts are geometric outpourings of the mental body. During the due course of preparation, they are vitalized and germinated through the union of the mental plane with the physical brain, which, as father and mother, gives birth to the child a thought. In order to think, it is necessary for the entity to have in his being a center of conscious power, a sutratmic vortex of the same rate of vibration as the mental plane. Going to pause there, folks. A couple key ideas are brought up here. See, the author here is referring to thoughts, right? The, the combination of uh, the mental plane with the physical brain here. That would be the father and the mother. See, the mental would be the father and the physical the mother. Uh, and they give birth to a child, which is a thought. So, uh, you see, he's kind of giving um, a, a type of a, a connotation of life to your thoughts. See, when he's talking this way? So your thoughts have life of their own. And uh, then he also says here, in order to, th to think, it is necessary for the entity to have in his being a center of conscious power, a sutratmic vortex. And that's an important idea, folks. A vortex. Um, this is part of the uh, uh, the geometry that our, our, you know, our world runs on. Okay? Vortexes and toroids. These are the conjugate, uh, uh, you know, geometries of the universe that we live in. Uh, the toroid and the, uh, the vortex. See, they're... It, it goes along with the whole electrical and magnetic idea. Once again, it's one of those dualistic principles, but it's it's definitely, it underskirts our entire reality. And if you think of things as being electric and magnetic or, you know, masculine, feminine, same idea. All this contrived into one idea right here <clears throat> when it's talking about thoughts, giving birth to thoughts. See, your thoughts. And let's go back to where we left off here. Uh, I'll read this last part again, and we'll move on from there. In order to think, it is necessary for the entity to have in his being a center of conscious power, a sutratmic vortex of the same rate of vibration as the mental plane. Around this he builds the mental aura, which consists of an egg-shaped vehicle 
either uniformly ended or with the upper end slightly larger. This being attuned to Saturn, the mind born is of a dark indigo color, but pierced with the thought form of many colors and usually fringed with a fine hem of golden light, sometimes changing to green and orange. This body, which is the vehicle of consciousness on the mental plane, is the highest we are capable of building at the present time, the vortices of the higher bodies being as yet latent. Gonna pause there, folks. So, he's equating the idea of uh, these thought forms being attuned to Saturn. So there's your Saturnian ideas again. Uh, this talks about uh, time. Um, we're we're time-bound. We are time-bound, and that is as high as we could go right now, according to this. That's why we're time-bound. Now, he, I guess uh, what he's implying here is, at this present time, uh, we are time-bound, or, or the, the state that we're in now. We're bound by time, and our thoughts are bound by time. Uh, but there's, I guess, according to him, what he's implying here is there's higher states of being where you're no longer confined by the bounds of time. So that's an interesting idea in and of itself. But uh, let's go back to the reading. The masters of wisdom, the highest initiates of our life wave... Oh, sorry, let me start that over again. The masters of wisdom, the highest initiates of our of our life wave function in their mental bodies, which some of them are capable of molding into a close facsimile of the human form. This is the body from which issues the thought forms, strange geometric outpourings, and many colored waves and rays. These are also the children of man. Having created them, he is responsible for them, as he is incapable of preventing them from going forth in the spirit of their creator." We are eternally surrounded by our own emanation bodies, which are pouring into the infinite reservoirs both constructive and perverted streams of energy. These streams of energy are the result of our vitalizing emotions and thoughts and giving to them the power of our immortality. Okay, that's the end of that section right there, folks, and I'm going to uh, just go ahead and point out again. He's pointing out some very important ideas that... Uh, the things that we think on and act on and our emotional states. All of these different ideas, uh, they extend beyond ourselves, okay? And uh, they, they could take on lives of their own, in a sense. That's what he's pointing out. So, once again, this is an admonition to man to be careful on the things that you think on and act upon. Okay, let's move to the next part here. Devachan. In the eastern lands, Devachan is called the home of the Devas, a great race of spiritual creations, or rather higher astral creations, who never appear in the physical plane, but who function continually in their astral bodies, or occasionally in their mental bodies. The Devas are correlated sometimes with the salamanders, but this is incorrect, as the thinking student readily comprehends. The ancients recognized three groups of these Devas. One... The formless divas of the higher mental planes, whose vehicles are formed of the cloudless night of the Arupa substance, and it says in parentheses, abstract mental essence. Number two, the bodied divas, who are the great being whose home is on the Rupa, or form mental plane, composed of concrete mind stuff, similar in texture to thought forms. And number three, the fire divas, or the inhabitants of the higher astral plane, Devachan. See, so I'm uh, going to pause there. The higher astral plane is called Devachan, according to them. And it's inhabited by these fire divas, which are very similar to the salamanders, or the fire elementals, described in part one here. Uh, so we could see he's describing many different things here. And a lot of these are exist on what he calls the mental plane, or what would sometimes be called the ethereal plane, uh, depending on who you're talking to with this. So we see that there's different levels of these, these planes of existence as well, different compartmentalizations of it. And uh, some of these are formless, and some of these have concrete mind stuff, similar in texture to thought forms, it says here. So it, these are very abstract ideas, okay? And, uh, you know, 
make what you will of them. Uh, I think there's some truth behind what he's he's talking about here, and that uh, you know our our universe operates in in mysterious ways, and it is intelligently guided. And there's you know many intelligences around us we're unaware of. Um, our universe is teeming with life, like we would not recognize. And I would probably venture to say more of a multiverse than universe, if you want to consider it in that way, if it being multidimensional or multifaceted or multiplanar, however you want to look at it. But uh, let's get back to the reading here. The divas form part of a great group of spiritual entities who assist in carrying out the directions of the Logos. They are wonderful creatures endowed with great wisdom, glory, and power, and they never appear on the physical plane. Their knowledge is apparently limitless, and those who have met one of these strange creatures are not likely to forget the experience. The divas form one group of man's instructors on the higher planes of nature. These beings are from the waves of creation, evolving as children thrown out of the superphysical bodies of deities. Some of them are called skin-poor creatures, others are fire-born. In many of the ancient doctrines, they were called blood-born, and in still others, children of thought. As surely as these creatures are the mind-born sons of God, so surely are the thought forms and astral elementals the mind and fire-born sons of human beings. Man is responsible for these strange creatures who float around and battle for ages before they are finally dissolved in the essences of God's body. Had man the power of immortal creation, he would people the elements with these demons. But as yet he is only learning. In this is his salvation. Wow, and that is the end of that part of this, uh, this uh, you know, chapter here, folks. <clears throat> so, once again, we're seeing a lot of other important ideas being alluded to here. They're, he's talking about these beings. They're the fireborn. They're the bloodborn. Uh, they're children of thought. The sons of God, and that's all in capitals. The mindborn sons of God. Uh, so, he's talking about... Um, what they would call these, um, this hierarchy. See, the, the, these the, these are the beings that uh, I, I believe Alice Bailey and Madame Blavatsky and stuff were speaking of when they were talking about the hierarchy. And when we go into Alice Bailey's book, the externalization of the hierarchy, these are the the beings that are directing things. See, I, I think that's what's being alluded to here. Uh, in, especially in those other works and stuff as well, that these uh, alleged uh, beings, these divas per se, that they're calling them here, that's what Manly P. Hall's calling them here, that these natural powers are um, kind of steering the direction that humanity's going. Now, there's a couple contradictions in here, because he says that these beings... Um, <clears throat> Never appear in physical form. Well, then, how do you know? <laughs> Have you ever talked to them? If you can't perceive them, how do you talk to them? And they would say, oh, well, clairvoyance, or, you know, if, you, if you're a high initiate, you can see into these other planes and, you know, and experience this stuff. Uh, and, and that's the thing. We're, we're taking their word for it here. So it's the same kind of thing here. But, uh, like I said, I think there are some spiritual truths being uh, expressed here. And, uh, you know, whether you take this stuff seriously or not, or whether you believe it or not, keep in mind, people in positions of power very much do. So they believe they're taking marching orders from this hierarchy uh, of beings, these, these higher order beings that are giving them direction at the topmost levels of the, the power pyramid here. Uh, you know, these dark occultists who run things, this is where they get their marching orders from, or this is where they think they get their marching orders from, are these types of beings, which they also wholeheartedly believe serve God, the Creator. Okay, you see that? We, we heard that being alluded to here. Um, I would say they're, they're being deceived, but, uh, you know, who could say for sure? But let's get back on with the reading here. We're going to do chapter 4 now, and then we're going to finish up after chapter 4, and we'll leave uh, the rest for part 3 of this series. <coughs> 
Chapter 4, Ghosts and Specters. Now this part's going to get pretty fascinating here too. Ghosts and Specters. Besides the living inhabitants of the elements, there is another great group of elementals, commonly called the Shades, Ghosts, or Specters. We now group under one heading as ghosts, both decarnated spirits, and the shells which float lifeless in the essences of the superphysical planes. This is incorrect, for in truth, the word ghost, taken from the word gust, means a passing shadow, or the reflection cast by the light upon the surrounding darkness. Jehovah, the god of form, and the Shiva of India, the third aspect of the Trimuti, like Osiris, the third aspect of the Egyptian trinity, is represented as the lord of sh the shades, or the shadows of the underworld. In reality, all bodies are ghosts because they are phantoms of the real. That which is a shadow of the eternal is called a ghost or specter, and it has no reality save through the reflection of life upon substance. Over graveyards at night there hang globes of phosphorescent light and wavy draperies of phosphorus, for the human body, when disintegrating, creates a luminous mist. The ancient peoples called this luminous mist a shadow or shade. It was also said that the shades of men walked the byways of their past, like Hamlet's ghost on the castle battlement. Generally speaking, we may divide the ghosts who walk in the night into two great classes. First, there are the disintegrating bodies of decarnated intelligences. Man dies not once in nature, but many times. He sloughs off not only a physical vehicle, but also an etheric body, an astral body, and later a mental body. These are cast off, the densest first, like the skins of an onion. When cast off from, from the spiritual monad, each of these shells floats in its own essence of being for a considerable time before entirely disintegrating. Because the subtle essences of nature preserve for many ages the bodies of which they are composed in the same way that alcohol preserves flesh. The essences of nature are filled with slowly decomposing bodies which were cast off after their experiences ha had been incorporated into the spiritual organisms of man. In these essences of nature there also dwell creatures who take upon themselves these slowly dissolving bodies as a player dons a masquerade costume or wears a mask. Gonna pause there, folks. <coughs> dons a masquerade costume or wears a mask. See? Um, and <laughs> I just find that, uh, you know, uh, a little apropos that, that he says that because this is kind of the NPC archetype, you see, you know, in a way. Uh, donning a costume, but he's talking about, uh, you know, on, on the spiritual plane here, or on the, like the etheric plane, uh, more so. But uh, you could see the, the allegory represented actually in the physical world today, uh, this way. But anyway, not to dwell too long on that idea, but let's get back to the reading. Those who do this are usually the elementals of the ether. The ghosts seen are usually etheric bodies from which the spiritual consciousness has fled, and they either drift past the vision of man, like a derelict floating on the sea, partly animated by the subtle substances of the ethers, or else they have been vitalized, or sometimes humanized, by an intelligence from one of these subtle planes. Gonna pause there. So you see, um, it says that when uh, an incarnated being here, uh, a person dies physically, their etheric body goes on for some time afterwards, and eventually their spirit leaves the etheric body and leaves behind, in the etheric world, this shell, this etheric shell. And sometimes elementals will take up residence in that shell, or some other intelligence will take up residence in that shell in the etheric to manifest. See, that's what he's saying here. Uh, this is actually a very fascinating uh, theory as to what ghosts are or, or what uh, you know the, these things can be and I, I find the, the whole uh, topic pretty fascinating actually but let's get back to the reading people say the vision I saw was not a floating corpse it moved it raised its hands and looked at me they do not realize that this drifting, moving mass of etheric protoplasm is floating upon the surface and in the mists of a sea of ether. 
If one were to walk upon the ocean bottom and see the great waving branches of seaweed dimly outlined in the pale green light, one would see a lifeless substance incapable in itself of animation beyond the vital principle of propagation and incapable of animal motion. One would see this substance swaying and moving, twisting and turning as though alive. One would see long streams of the seaweed reach out and curl like the great body of a boa constrictor, waving its long sinuous branches in the same way that the ghost of the night points its finger and directs its glassy eye toward the victim of the vision. The movement is not initiated, however, within the thing which we see moving, but is the result of the movement of external forces. Gonna pause there. Uh, the author is pointing out the existence of ether and, you know, compares ether to water, you see. And that's an important distinction because ether uh, is actually the medium in which everything exists. And it completely, completely uh, changes the way we would view physics if we accept ether. And uh, I think that there's uh, definitely something to the idea of ether. And I believe the ether idea is accurate and does permeate our reality. And our science needs to change to uh, kind of acknowledge this. And I think once we do, we'll have some major breakthroughs. Uh, but as of right now, it doesn't fit with the hyper-materialist view. So the idea of ether has been summarily discarded. So oh, I think it's important, though. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, back to the reading. Only those who have been conscious on the lower planes of the ethereal worlds can understand what it means to see these floating shells drifting, drifting ever fainter until many years later, sometimes centuries, a, stra a strange face so faint as hardly to be visible marks the final disintegration of the ethereal specter. The etheric plane is really part of the physical world. It is tied to the physical globe because, in reality, it is the mold into which the dense body is cast, just as the physical anatomy of man is really molded into the etheric double. The etheric body is purely a physical substance, but far more attenuated than the solids, liquids, and gases which we see. It is more or less tied to the physical body, sometimes disintegrating with it, but usually remaining differentiated from the substance of the astral world. The etheric body hovers over or near the grave where the body has been placed and sometimes leads to an earthbound condition. To prevent this possibility, the ancient occultists cremated the physical body. When this is done, nothing remains to tie the higher intelligence to matter, the body having been entirely reduced to basic inorganic substance. The first dawning of etheric vision, which is really nothing more than an extension of physical sight and not clairvoyance as some imagine, brings man into the world of specters, the borderland between the physical and true superphysical worlds. Here he sees these forms in flowing draperies, formed out of the fine atoms of this world, seething and twisting, like the dreams of Dante, in endless clouds. Millions of them stretch as far as the eye can reach, floating in groups and wavy lines in the sea of ether which preserves them. In the endless march of time they are slowly reduced, however, the atoms returning to the etheric world in the same manner that physical atoms finally return to dust. And as the physical atoms are incorporated again into ever-changing bodies, and as that which was once in the body of man may next appear in the organism of plant or animal, so the ether which once was attracted by the centers of etheric consciousness to build a body, when dispelled by time, finally gathers itself into new forms. The particles of man's own etheric body were made from the disintegrating atoms of the millions of ghosts that have been floating in the ethers since eternity began. To this sea of ether, the body that man now has will be returned when its labor for him is completed and when the records which he has implanted in it and which are necessary for his soul growth, have been extracted from it and incorporated into his higher vehicles. Man has a body in each of the worlds of nature, which he has now connected up in his fourfold consciousness. Gonna pause there, folks. Um, this is an important idea, fourfold consciousness. Remember that. This is the four-square man, okay? Same kind of idea once again. Uh, when we look at that, the four-square man, the four-fold consciousness, okay? 
Um, so th this is saying that uh, we don't just have physical form, but our consciousness permeates these different realms or different realities, different worlds, different planes. So let's keep that in mind, but let's, let's move on with the reading here. <clears throat> the various groupings of his expression as they manifest through form, growth, motion, and thought are inspired by a complete organism, which in man is called a body, and in the grand man, a plane of nature. Each one of these bodies functions on its own respective plane. Man is born into each one of these planes as the sutrapmic atom descends and by the law of attraction gathers a body upon the, that plane. This body grows in a natural progressive manner, and then as he slowly drops off vehicles in the decarnate state until finally only the nomadic atom remains upon the Arupa plane, he discards each one of these bodies. The discarded bodies become ghosts or shells in the superphysical world, just as the physical body, when the spiritual ego has departed, becomes a lifeless thing, preserving the shape of the living creature, but without consciousness or intelligence. Gonna pause there, folks. You hear that? So, basically, we have these, what the, he would call a seed atom, which is basically... Uh, the primary core of what we would consider our consciousness. And it manifests in our physical form, and also attached to these physical forms are these other forms, the etheric form, the astral form, the mental form. Okay, And all these planes are interconnected. You see, man is the gate between worlds, and that's an important idea here, especially uh, when we get into the topic of transhumanism. Okay, Man is actually the gateway between worlds. This is an important idea, and this is why artificial intelligence in and of itself can never be sentient. Uh, because, you see, it doesn't have this link between worlds. And this is why the transhumanists really push the idea of merging with the machines. Because they want to open the gate and let some of these other uh, intelligences within our world, the physical world. They, they want to be able to have these different uh, entities, per se, manifest in the physical world through the use of the gateway, you see. Um, and, and this is kind of an important idea to keep in mind, too. And uh, we'll talk about that some other time. It's a, a big idea, but I think it's at the core of why uh, the push for technocracy and the push for transhumanism, because... Uh, these uh, alleged beings that uh, uh, manifest and exist in these, these various different worlds, per se, or these different planes of existence, uh, they desire nothing more than to manifest here in the physical world. And we'll, we'll get to more of that in, as we get further into studies here, uh, as we, we study further into many of these types of books, okay, and these dif different types of writings and the teachings of the ancient mystery schools and the various uh, secret societies and stuff we'll see how these beings, these, this quote-unquote, this hierarchy, uh, these higher spiritual beings, how they want nothing more than to manifest here in the physical world to be human, okay? And we'll, we'll see as we, we get further down the pike here in studying these things why this is important and how it all ties to this whole transhumanist idea and how it's all very uh, nefarious at its core. But uh, anyway, let's get back to the reading here, because a lot of this stuff is very fascinating. Uh, where did we leave off? <clears throat> okay. Left off right here. Okay. This process is symbolized by the ancients as the moon, which is, in truth, a ghost, its intelligence having incarnated into the earth. It is a dead shell lifeless, but impelled by the power of the great disintegrator in nature, which is the lord of the ghost or specter, in other words, the regent of the moon. Second, there is the earthbound spiritual consciousness, which sometimes visits the living, but in this case, usually through the lower astral body. Consequently, it is never seen save when the individual is partially asleep. People who have seen these specters always affirm by all they hold dear, that they were wide awake. The consciousness is wide awake, but it is functioning momentarily in the lower astral body. Therefore, analysis proves that the physical body does not move during a vision. They are incapable of standing up and approaching the specter. They think 
and are alive and awake, but it is always in a semi-dreaming stage in which they are partly under the dominion of sleep. At this time, the physical body is in repose and the lower physical qualities do not intersect or express themselves. Then many people become slightly clairvoyant and see the ghosts and specters of this world. The specter usually takes the form of a gray-lined image, usually hooded in a dun-colored or gray garment and surrounded by a bluish-gray light. After the departed person has been away from the physical plane for some years, the lower part of the body becomes merely a hanging drapery and finally vanishes altogether, because the higher astral plane preserves only the consciousness of the face. These specters usually appear because of strong earthly ties, such as jealousies and wrongdoing. Great love or great hate also draw them. By his avarice, therefore, the miser is recalled to his treasures. These are the phantom forms which curse old castles with their presence like the famous ghosts of Hampton Court and the ghost of Hamlet's father. Once they are free from the pang of conscience or of work left unfinished, these specters disappear because the consciousness dies out of the astral body and this body becomes merely a shell. The shell is then often assumed by elementals who continue to haunt the place where the spirit itself once did. A great percentage of the visions seen by mediums are merely these etheric shells vitalized by an elemental of the astral or etheric world. The earth-binding ties of narrow concepts, ignorant one-pointedness of purpose, or similar conditions can be found in many instances. For many months after the close of the World War, and I'm going to pause there, folks, he's speaking of World War I, because this book was written right after World War I, but, post, yeah, but before World War II. Um, so let's get back, I'll continue with that sentence. For many months after the close of the World War, soldiers on both sides who had died fighting rose from the battlefield and fought in the air, wholly unconscious of the fact that they were dead. They maimed and destroyed each other, cursed and swore, and lived again among the bursting shells and shrapnel, just as in the days when they were visible soldiers. Still others wandered among the forests of crosses in the great graveyards in Flanders and France, wondering after many years of death what had happened to them. The sea is still peopled with phantom ships whose crews have long been dead, but who still sail for the port, which they were never able to reach alive. Among the ocean liners, in the ancient galleons on the etheric plain, the old Spanish buccaneer still counts his gold, tied by the bonds of materiality and selfishness of the world of which he is no longer a part. The dope den is still peopled by the spirits of those who died slaves to the curse, and who some back again to live and breathe in its fumes and filth. Like great vampire bats, they seek to live and gratify again the passions of their lives by grasping the minds and souls of the living and obsessing them still here. <coughs> All these things teach a great fact, which may be divided into many lesser facts. The answer to the problem of the earthbound is twofold. The first is righteousness, and the second is non-attachment. Those who have done well in this world need not worry, nor need they come back to beg forgiveness or haunt the footsteps of those they wronged, waiting for liberation. Those who are not attached to the things of this earth go straight about their master's business in other worlds as well, and go on and on fulfilling their duty. Then again, if the people of this world would, in spirit and in truth, release the dead, they would not be surrounded by the specters who wail and pray, held by a force they cannot understand. When we weep for the dead, when we long for them to come back, we draw them from the master's work and surround ourselves with phantoms that can never return, but whom we can hold and keep from their life duty. The second great lesson is that of the shell. This thing floating in the ether and in the lower worlds of the astral plane can help or guide us in our path to salvation no more than a corpse could save us here. These shells are the things most often seen in visions. They are obsessed by lower elementals and the larvae of the lower astral plane. They rap on the table and tilt the chairs. They materialize their fruit and paint their pictures. And man foolishly makes gods out of creatures that are not even human. Let the student investigate these worlds for himself, or if he is incapable yet of investigating them, let him learn the great truth that man owes no allegiance to that which he does not know. 
to his God, he owes only the allegiance which his dawning consciousness has shown him that God deserves. Only with perfect consciousness will come perfect understanding and perfect cooperation with nature's workings. The ghosts of old graveyards and specters of a dream should be sent back into the plains from whence they came, where as shells they will float until eternally dissolved, dissolves them, or, if still the vehicle of consciousness of the spirit, be liberated to learn the lessons of the new world wherein they are. There, unhindered by human emotion, they will absorb the fruitage of their respective bodies and build it into an eternal body, the temple of the soul, which is the crowning jewel, the achievement of human evolution. And that is the end of the reading tonight, folks. <coughs> going to touch on a couple key points there right at the end. Uh, the author here says, To his God he owes only the allegiance, which his dawning consciousness shall show him that God deserves. Hmm. That's an interesting idea, isn't it? That's, uh... That, that doesn't really jive with, uh, you know, the creator I know. Um, I, I will show him... He has not given me a reason not to show him allegiance. So, uh, I will give him all allegiance rather than that which I think that he deserves. Me being a finite man. Uh, not a perfect cr uh, creator, but being a created being... I don't think I should be judging God or the Creator to you, but that's exactly what he's saying here. Um, and no, we don't have perfect understanding or anything. He's correct about that, but uh, being is how he acknowledges we don't have perfect understanding, why would he say something like that? You could see the little bit of vehemence um, that they have towards the Creator, towards God. You see, they, they want to usurp God. They, they want to be God. They want to be better than God, see. And uh, that, that's kind of why they, they take little jabs at him here and there in very subtle ways in many of these writings. So we see that being said right there. And it's also an important idea to look here at the very end, the last sentence here. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm going to read that again. It says... There, unhindered by human emotion, they will absorb the fruitage of their respective bodies and build it into an eternal body, the temple of the soul, which is the crowning jewel, the great achievement of human evolution. You see, folks, they think um, in terms of evolution evolving to the next level, see, becoming God. And they're talking about the, the quote-unquote crowning jewel. And the crown idea is very important there, too. too. Uh, this is man exalting himself above the creator. That's what this is talking about. Building an eternal body. Himself, the temple of the soul. Uh, talking about doing all this work themselves. Okay? Him, himself. Man, building himself a new eternal body. The crowning jewel. The great achievement of human evolution. Okay, folks, this is nothing more than um, the same kind of talk that you'll hear going on about transhumanism. It's the next step. It's the achievement of human evolution. The, uh, you know, becoming a man, becoming God. See, that's what they're looking for. That's what they're aiming for. That's what their dream of ages has been here. Uh, they want to usurp God and become God. And you could see. He says here, to his God he owes only the allegiance which his dawning consciousness has shown him that God deserves. So, uh, he's saying only give God the respect that you think he deserves. See, uh, he's, he's passing judgment on the creator here. Uh, that, that's exactly what he's doing. Uh, you know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of a, a spit in the eye kind of situation for the creator and y you could see how a lot of times they'll use subtle phrases like this or they'll, they'll say very subtle things to kind of give you the hint as to what their intentions and motives really are and uh let's make it un you know let's make it perfectly clear here uh, in no uncertain terms these people the 
these uh, ones at the topmost levels of these secret societies, these dark occultists that run things, these, these people in positions of power in this world, these arbiters of technocracy, that's what they want. They want to become God and usurp God. And they can't stand God, and they can't stand the God of Christianity, and they do not like Christians either. Because, see, uh, this is a stumbling block for them. And Christ said he would be so. He would be a stumbling block to these people. And he is, and they can't stand it. So they need to rid the world of Christianity. And uh, they, they do so in very subtle ways at times. And you can see uh, just their hubris and their general dislike of uh, the Creator and the dislike of Christianity as an actual uh, organization or as a, a movement upon this world. So, anyway, that's the end of the reading here tonight. Uh, we'll come back uh, next time for part three, in which we will talk about the quote-unquote the Dweller on the Threshold, and that'll be part three. And uh, that's the end of part two tonight, folks. I hope you enjoyed it, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for hanging out with me.